Okay, no EuroPython or any Python conference is complete without at least one talk on packaging, and this must be at least the second. So we, let's see what Yuriki has to tell us. Thank you. If you don't mind, I'm going to wait for a tiny bit for clock to hit three ish, or then I'm just depressed. No one comes. Actually, before you all can run away, I'm going to take a photo of you. This is a created a zero chance that that happens when I start speaking. Okay. Guten Tag, Europaton, or Herzlich Willkommen. Uh, that's my outcome of two years of German studies while in elementary school. Unfortunately, I can't do better. But welcome, everyone, uh, to a talk about a tool called DH Virtual N, or as I label it, packaging in uh, packaging. But before we look into that deeper, let me introduce myself. So my name is Jurke Pulljonen. I I'm from Finland, but I'm living in Stockholm, Sweden nowadays. I work for a music streaming company called Spotify. In there, I do kind of do two stuffs. I am a content engineer, so I build like a pipeline of new music to the service. And on the other hand, I also fiddle around a lot with our internal Python stack and answer people's questions about Python. Uh, if you want to reach out to me, there's my email address and there's my Twitter handle. So please do if you have any questions. Uh, now, about this talk. Uh, this talk will be in uh, three different sections. First, we're going to look into some of the existing deployment strategies you can use uh, on a uh, Debian and Ubuntu-based machines. Then we're going to look into what actually is DH virtual environment and how does it differ from the existing deployment strategies. And in the end, we are going to go through an example of how you package software. And we're going to package Sentry, mostly because it's not a simple piece of software. So I'm going to show you, by example, how you can use DH Virtual N to package something like Sentry in production. Now, let's start with a tiny quiz. Uh, who here runs a Debian or Ubuntu-based system? Good, you found the correct talk then. Uh, who here deploys stuff using the so-called native packages on Debian system, like relying on the native libraries on those systems? Who here is kind of frustrated with that? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Who here uses virtual environment? Like you set up a virtual environment, and then you pip install everything in there on your production host. <laughs> cool. Now, these both have their uh, good sides too. If we take, for example, the native Debian packages. So this table, the stuff that gets in the Debian, especially stuff that's in main, is stable. It's well tested. People usually don't change them so that the backwards compatibility uh, breaks. So if your Debian system gets an update for, let's say, Python requests, you know that that request is something that's backwards incompatible with the previous version. Now, Debian has an, or Debian packaging has another nice bone side. You can declare non-Python dependencies. So say your software requires SQLite to be installed, or your software requires MySQL to be installed on the same machine. When you create the Debian packages, you can say that your package depends on MySQL, and you get that one installed on the machine. Everything nicely contained in one package. It also has pretty neat existing infrastructure. So not only you have like a, uh, dedicated build tools or separated build environments like sbuild and other ch root solutions, but you also have the uh, possibility of running your own app repository, which means that you will have your own way or like own network of deploying your stuff and production. Plus, all kinds of CI tools like Jenkins or TeamCity have at least some rudimentary support for dealing with Debian packages. And the last good thing, I think, in the Debian packaging is, uh, is that you have a quite nice scripting support. What that means is that if you need to 
remove a cache when you up, upgrade uh, your package version. You can write the script that before you upgrade your package, it'll clear, clear out the cache. Or if you want to restart your service after you've installed it, you can write the script that if after installation, it'll restart your service. You can do crazy, borderline stupid stuff like database migrations in postings. postings. I don't necessarily recommend them, but you can do all kinds of stuff there. It gives you quite a lot of power. Now, that was the good part. Then if we start talking about the bad part, you probably have run into this case where you see that, oh, let's say, back in the days, Kenneth worked hard and pushed out request 1.3, and that has just the feature you need, but unfortunately, your ancient uh, cobweb filled box is running request 1.2, and what do you think? Are you gonna wait for Debian to package that? What happens, you're just gonna rot in front of your computer waiting for the newer requests, especially if it's a backward compatible, to come on the uh, current system you're running. So a lot of stuff in Debian, even at the release of that particular Debian or Ubuntu release, is already outdated. Uh, the packaging itself is kind of complex. So what we're talking here is that someone created a packaging system that is built for building a whole operating system. So it covers all the possible corner cases, all the possible scenarios, if you want to deploy Perl, Haskell, Python, you name it, it has everything covered. That means that the whole system is really, really complex and the documentation is far from uh, simple. In addition to that, all the documentation that you usually can find is also geared towards Debian package maintainers. So, okay, you want to ship this thing within the operating system, so this is how you should do. And it does not necessarily resonate to how you yourself uh, would deploy your tiny service in the host. And what I think is the worst part in Debian packages is that you get a global state. So if you're only deploying all your libraries as Debian packages and then using them, eventually, you'll end up having a case where you would like to upgrade one library, but it's also used by some other software on the same box, and you don't know if you can do it without breaking anything. We've had this at Spotify uh, a plethora of times when we have rolled out like a, a new common Python utils libraries on the host, and we are just too afraid of deploying that because we might, we are kind of afraid that something down the line might break even if we have been testing it for months. So it kind of slows you down and it's really, really annoying. Now, if you think about virtual environments then, so what you get in the virtual environment is somewhat the opposite. So you get the hot new stuff, you just do pip install and you get whatever is available in PyPI, like the latest release, you can, and you can go even go to the extent of like, you can git, open your git or mercurial and just pull the stuff in your virtual environment and run it in there. So you can always get the newest, hottest stuff. Uh, it has become kind of a de facto method in the Python world. So every guide usually contains a word or two how you run stuff inside the virtual environment. You can do the same virtual environment stuff on your laptop as you can do on your servers, and it kind of works. Uh, it's also battle tested. So nowadays, so many people are running it in production, so it's fairly safe to use that one. But the best part, I think, is that it's contained. So if you take a package and install it in, inside a virtual environment, a Python package, you can be sure that it won't affect anything outside that virtual environment. So updating a simple packages or doesn't mean that your whole system crumbles because something was relying on an older, or older version or that you would interfere with the underlying operating system. No, nope, you're only poking the actual virtual environment and you get this nice contained fuzzy wheel feeling when uh, dealing with that. Now on the downside, I bet some of you might have seen this line. That means that you can't have any native dependencies if you're using uh, virtual environments and pip install. You need to know what MySQL libraries you have to have available. Like in this case, you need to know that you have to install MySQL client to find this MySQL config on your host. So it requires you to do some manual digging through things. Even more, you end up doing source installs, okay? So you can have wheels or even eggs to avoid source installs, but if you don't have wheels for your platform or you don't have, haven't set up your own wheel repository, you end up doing source installations. And when you have your virtual environment, 
in your production server, you end up installing all the dependencies for that source installation on that production environment, which is not necessarily bad in the sense that you break something, but you'll just clutter your production environment with development headers and other uh, unused files. But the worst part, what I think is with the pip installs, is that you're basically executing a bunch of random scripts. So sure, we'll get around this, but if you run setup.py install, you probably haven't looked into what all those files do or what all those files that those packages depend on do. So you're just relying on a good faith of people and you're in, like running random stuff in your production environment. It doesn't even need to be malicious to hurt you. Someone might just accidentally release a package that wipes your whole ETC or your whole home directory or something and you by accident uh, end up crippling your system. Now, this brings us to question then, what is uh, DH Virtual N? So DH Virtual N was about so two years ago, my attempt to combine the best of the two worlds. So it is a virtual environment that is placed inside Debian package. It supports both Python 2 and 3. It is kind of version agnostic. I won't say that you can't install Python 1 stuff with that, but it doesn't execute or import any, it doesn't import any Python code, so it doesn't really care if your, if your tool is written with Python 2 or Python 3. You can use it anyway. It even supports using the new virtual environment package with 3.3, so you don't even need to install virtual n uh, to run it. It's also open source, so it's GPL, like all the Debian build tools. It has a good documentation. Now, I'm the guy who wrote it, so I have, might be a bit biased here. But I think the documentation is good. It's at least better than the average open source documentation. But the best part, which seems to be actually very functional, is that it has a simple tutorial. So if you go to dhwordchamp.readthedocs.org, you find there's a four-step tutorial that you can run through, and boom, your package is inside, inside a virtual environment inside a Debian package. Uh, under the surface, it is a Deb helper extension. So Deb helper is this, how would you make it pretty, like a pile of Perl scripts that Debian executes. Uh, when you're building packages. It's a certain fixed sequence of Perl scripts that you uh, install, and then there are different extensions for Debian to know how to, how to build packages for Python packages or how you build Perl packages or how you build, I don't know, bash completion stuff. So what DH virtual and does, it just injects itself into that flow. So there's 12 lines Perl included there that does that magic to inject the DH virtual in there, and then it just runs as a part of the sequence. Now, this is kind of like uh, the implementation details, but for you who already have existing Debian build environments, like if you're using sbuild or something else, or just plain dbuild or dpackage build package on the command line, this means that using DH virtual n is just going to work in your existing workflow. So what I basically did back in the days was that I found a great blog post by Hinek Slavak. I adapted the idea a bit to fit our built environment, and that's why I ended up writing developer extensions. Now, Hinek's system works well too, but it uses a thing called FPM, which back in the days didn't fit our build system. Now, in practice, the DH virtual environment is a packaging builder that it creates a virtual, virtual environment, you can define uh, what Python you want to use with it. So if you have multiple Python installed in your machine, you just pick the one you want. It installs everything you have listed in requirements of TXC. And this is the exact same format you get with pip freeze. Uh, it installs those inside the virtual environment. Then it takes your project and runs setup.py install on that. So it just doesn't dump your sources in there. It actually installs your project inside the virtual environment. And then it does a bunch of magic, which is like, set scripts, where big thanks actually goes to Hinek about those, and other stuff like rewriting activate files and so, so that you can actually run, like instead of having all your build system paths, it will contain your production system paths and you can use like uh, things like activate or activate this in the production and end up with the same virtual environment. Okay, so that's nice and cool. 
But let's see. Let's take a uh, project. Let's package something with DH return. Let's package uh, Sentry. So who here knows what Sentry is? Cool. So it's a really good exception tracking tool. We use it in our production systems. It works like a charm. And the best part for the example part is that when you install Sentry, if you have ever done pip install Sentry, it pulls down like half the Python package index. It pulls like whatever you can find. It depends on a lot of stuff. It's not because it's bad software. It's because it's a complex software in a good way. That sounds a bit bad. Well, <laughs> uh, anyway, let's let's see how we do the DH virtual. So first step is that we need to each install DH virtual. If you're running a modern operating system like Ubuntu Trusty or the Debian testing, the DH virtual is actually available inside those repos. You can just say apt get install DH virtual n and all of a sudden, you have the virtual, DH virtual N available in your uh, system. It's, as previously discussed, a bit old on Debian uh, and Ubuntu, but you know, it still works. Then you need to create a Debian directory inside your Sentry installation. So, Debian directory is a custom directory Debian uses to figure out what what stuff should it uh, like. It, from that, it figures out what packages should it build, what stuff should it run on the build time. And in that directory, you have to create a few files. There's a minimum set of four files that you need to create there. And don't be afraid. All of these are covered in the tutorial also. So when you start packaging your uh, Sentry, you add a control file. Now, this is the place which Debian uses to figure out what does it need for building. So you can see that Sentry requires the Python development headers for building. Uh, but for running it doesn't require anything special. So in this place, you have to just build depend on DH virtual and then write required dependencies like Python and stuff like that in there. But this is basically what how I did this today when I built the Sentry with the DH virtual is that I just copied over the tutorial stuff and changed the fields uh, that I felt would need to be changed, like package names. Then you need a change log. The change log is a well, it's a change log, but it's the file that is required for the Debian package to figure out some version. And it just tells Debian that we are packaging Sentry 6.4.4. Cool. And the third one, yeah, this is why the Debian packaging is the, comp the complex black magic thingy. The third one, you need to define what is called the compatibility level. So the Debian knows what, how it should build the package. What's relevant to you guys is probably just you echo 9 in that, in that compat file you're done, done with that. If you don't do that, it'll pick up some ancient compatibility level and won't build your package. So that's pretty much it. And the last part is the glorified make file, aka rules file, which just tells how you build stuff. Now, if you build Debian packages before for Python, you recognize, you probably recognize this file, and you can just see that we changed the Python 2 to be Python virtual n. This basically tells Debian that build this package using DH virtual n instead of the default way of building Python stuff. And that's it. You fire the package, build package, and it rolls, rolls through. You get the nice matrix-like output of stuff building, and all of a sudden you see, hey, look at that. It actually creates a virtual environment, puts pip, whatnot in there, and starts pulling half the internet down into your package. And once that's done, all is left for you is just take the Debian package, copy it on your production host, and install it there. Now, if you have defined something, some build depend, uh, some runtime dependencies in the control file, they get installed at the same time. And the best part is that you haven't executed any random scripts on your production system because all of them were done in your build system. Uh, you end you end up with uh, deploying the whole thing without cluttering any cluttering your production system with any development headers or st stuff like that. And you have a nice contained virtual environment in your production host. Okay, so once you've done that, let's look at the uh, kind of nice parts of the DH virtual end then. So what it gives you is that it gives you the non-Python dependencies or the possibility to define non-Python dependencies, just the way you could do with uh, normal Debian packages. It also leverages on the existing infrastructure of Debian building, so you can use your existing build agent, you can use your existing CI systems if you're already using them for Debian, or you can have your own apt repo still in use. It has the new hotness, 
So it's not, cont uh, it's not limited by what you can find on Debian. It, you can actually just pip install what's the newest stuff available. And as I told before, it's contained. So we end up with the virtual environment in certain place in your production system, and that's it. Of course, like, like any solution, there are also some negative point, uh, negative sides to this. The build times can be slow. So especially if you're not running your own PyPI mirror and you're not using wheels, you're basically downloading all the requirements from the internet and then building them, which means that yes, your build time will become long, uh, longer, but it can be also substantially mitigated by ha running your own mirror, which cuts down the network latency, and using wheels, which cut, cuts down the build times. Uh, it still requires you to dig some requirements, so you need to know what requirements you need, what native system requirements you need to have on those systems. It doesn't let you out of that loophole. So if you're running, let's say you're parsing XML using LXML, you need to make sure that you in, you're Control file depend, depends on installing libxml on your production system, as well as having the development headers for the build part. And the build system needs to have exactly the same Python. So, like, because it's virtual environment, what virtual virtual and thus it actually links outside the virtual environment for, uh, well, the linker links stuff on the production system. So you need to have the same Python available on your build system as you have on your production system, but it rarely is a, pro a problem if you are already having a existing build agent and stuff. Uh, for the future of the edge virtual end, I'm at least trying to address some of this stuff, like I'm looking into cookie cutter templates. Unfortunately, I didn't have time to prepare them for before this talk, but it would be sweet if you could just use cookie cutter and boom, you would have your DH virtual end packaging done with, without you, you don't need to go and echo nine on random files. Uh, I'm planning to add a trigger support, like if you get a minor update of your Python on your production host, it refreshes the virtual environment to make sure it still runs. And I'm also, this was actually a tip from, uh, oh, damn, I'm so bad with names, from Adam uh, from Discus when, I, when he was rehearsing his talk and we talked about this and he gave me a tip, like what if I could actually break out the dependency on system Python, like use PyN or something to incorporate the whole Python into the virtual environment. But that's pretty much it. If you wanna find out more, the source is available, open source, uh, under the Spotify umbrella in GitHub, and there, there is the good, emphasis on the word good, documentation on the read the docs, and then there's a blog post we posted when we released this. So with that, I thank you for your time. Thank you, Yuki. You've just saved me a lot of time. Uh, any questions to the microphones, please? Hi. Uh, great stuff. Thanks very much for that. Uh, the other time I was looking at your presentation, not your, but your colleague from Spotify about using Docker at, uh, for the deployment and uh, managing the infrastructure. I myself am right now struggling between Docker for dev and production, and right now in my company we are building uh, uh, the Debian packages actually, so this would be really, really cool to use. Uh, do you actually uh, do uh, uh, that you install some software based on this uh, uh, Debian packages and some other deployments based on Docker, or do you mix it? Uh, the current plan with the Python stuff uh, is to mix it, so uh, when, while, like, while Docker is great, it still doesn't solve the problem of de uh, defining dependencies. You're, so it basically boils down to two options. So either you write a Docker, uh, what's it, uh, recipe, build yeah. file, uh, that says like pip install this, pip install that, apt can install this, which kind of does the trick, but then you have the same problem that you would probably need like two different Docker images, one for building your package, somehow, then extracting that out and putting it into the other Docker, Docker image. The, so the benefit of the Docker is that you don't necessarily need the virtual environment because the Docker already provides the isolation. But we are leaning more and more towards to build Python software with this and then use the Debian package to dump that one into the Docker images. Okay, uh, and the ad my other question is, what do you use for your local APT repositories? 
I have no idea, but it's something fairly off the shelf. I okay. looked at it, but it's like it's Thanks. ancient installation. Hi. Oh. Yeah, I've got a question. Uh, does that support any grid mechanism as well? Uh, can you repeat the question, please? Yeah. Does uh, Does your system have a like a kind of a grid mechanism? If you want to, I don't know. Like, let's take the example of Sentry, and let's say your database needs some migration, and you want your package to be able to. Uh, to provide some, some, I don't know, whatever type of your rate. Your, your, your packaging need to have some changes from one version to another. Yeah, so because it's, it's a Debian package, so it will have all the post installation scripts and stuff like that that you can run. So if you want to run uh, scripts before removal, after removal, before installation, and so forth, you can uh, use the existing Debian infrastructure for that one. So it, it's. No, it's not too complicated to do those, but of course, it requires some knowledge of the Debian packaging at that point. Okay. Uh, one question related to that. Um, do you use these um, post-installation, pre-installation files for database migrations? So you said earlier you use something different, but uh, what do you use there? Uh, we, do have, we actually do have some pro projects that use the post install files. Uh, for database migration, but it's kind of, I feel it's kind of scary. Like if something accidentally triggers a package update and we get like an unwanted uh, migration, even if it would be tested safe. So usually we do that database migrations, uh, well, with some sort of manual steps, depending on the project. But yeah, you can do post instance uh, That project has been working. Fingers crossed with the future. Can you use system Python packages, or everyone, everything is installed uh, in virtualenv? For example, uh, LXML and Pillow Imaging Library. Yeah, uh, currently by design, everything is installed in the virtual environment. So, but it shouldn't be like it's not. It shouldn't be too hard to add like a feature to the virtualenv that where you can shoot in your both legs at the same time to allow the system packages. To be because yeah I, I see your uh, I see your point because LXML or Pillow are kind of annoying. Well, LXML is fairly easy, but Pillow is really annoying to install inside virtual environments. So yeah, it's probably something for future to add a flag that if you want to use the site packages or the existing ones, then why not? But currently no. Um, maybe you can remove from. Requirements txt and just add to depends. Yeah, yeah, but then like if you add it to the depends, it gets installed on the system level. But the virtual environment is built with the no site packages flag, so it won't see them. One one like uh, intermediate step you could take is that you could depend on pillow, let that install on the system level, and then you could use Python path when you start your software to point that in extension, uh, in addition to the virtual environments Python paths. So that could work, but I wouldn't go for, I wouldn't say sure if it's a viable solution or not. But nevertheless, like, uh, if you want that feature, please open a ticket in the GitHub. It should be fairly simple to implement, so I can just uh, build that. Okay, thank you. Or if you want to make a pull request, that's even better. Ah. Sorry. Uh, did you hear about uh, FPM, uh, so-called FP package management tool? Yeah, so that's the uh, Hinex blog post, uh, which is actually like doing this exact same stuff, but using FPM is, instead of injecting the developer sequence. I wanted to use that originally. It works. It gets the job done, uh, but it didn't fit our build systems. Mm -hmm. So then I ended up building a developer sequencer instead. Okay, uh, but if someone uh, starts from scratch and doesn't have uh, any legacy uh, that uh, he uh, wants it to use, uh, then how, uh, why uh, he could use your uh, product instead of FPM? What's uh, the advantages for him? I don't know if there's any specific reason for it. Like, uh, in that case, I would say go read the next blog post, check out the excellent documentation of my project and like decide on which one seems to be simpler. So I've, I've aimed to cater people who don't really know Debian packaging mm -hmm. at all to, so that it should be easy, but it's like it's the same with Linux blog post. You just follow steps and do stuff. Uh, so it's rather a matter of personal preference rather yeah, than features, much. yes? 
Okay, thanks. Just a quick one. Uh, is there any plan on your side uh, to port uh, to VC, for example, using backports that deviant the log? Yeah, that's that could be done. I'm already planning to like because Trusty is having 0.6, so I'm planning at least to set up a PPA for Trusty so that you get the the newer releases on uh, Trusty. Uh, this stuff builds fine on VC, so I built it on VC, but VC was already stable at that point when I released this. Yep. Uh, so it shouldn't be too hard to add it to the Debian backports for VC. Okay, so there are no technical reasons not to do that. No, it should work. No, this is this is really simple. And like we we build stuff with the edge version on top of Squeeze. So okay. it, so if it doesn't work on VC, then we've done something really bad and wrong in that case. Okay, thanks. Thank you. I think that's all the questions. Thank you very for a very oh. clear and very <laughs> useful talk, Jurgen. Thank you.